Now that we understand the interpretation from uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, right? The fourth king would be greater than them all, Xerxes. He'll stir up all against the realm of Grisha, which he did. But then verse 3, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Alexander the Great. Now let's talk about Greece, how it goes. Admirer of Cyrus the Great. And then he just made the empire even bigger through his conquests. Morris says, this mighty king is none other than Alexander the Great, 334 to 323 BC. After more than another century of Persian power and Greco-Persian wars, Alexander decisively defeated the Persians and swiftly conquered the other nations of his day. He was the he-goat of the prophecies of Daniel chapter 8, verse 5 through 7 and verse 21. This can also be compared with other dispensational scholars' works, Larkin, in his book of Daniel, as well as the Schofield Reference Bible. All right, but let's keep reading on. Now what happened? Verse 4, And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. So notice over here that now it's divided into four kingdoms. That's where the Diodaci comes in over here. They take Alexander the Great's empire and it's been scattered into four broken parts. Now we come to the next, uh, the two of the important four parts. You'll notice that as it was divided into four at verse four, verse five, God sees it as what? The king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Now we come to the king of the south. Henry Morris says over here, here begins the detailed prophecy of the future conflicts that would develop between two of the divisions of Alexander's empire, the descendants of Ptolemy the first in Egypt and those of Seleucus the first in Syria. All right. That's the key in your Bible where you see a lot of end times teachings now. Because it is carried on from the first century what the Lord is seeing over here. So we see over here the Ptolemies and then we also see the uh, Seleucus. Yeah, Seleucus. They paved the way later on where you're going to see Cleopatra and Julius Caesar involved over there. So Julius Caesar, he came at the right time when they were all scattered and broken up. And then he strengthened the Roman Empire even further. And Jesus timed it immediately when Julius Caesar did that. Especially when C Caesar, Caesar Augustus, who is also known as Octavius, where, they were, where he was battling uh, with his... Uh, we're going to cover him later on where, you know, the other guy had relationship with Cleopatra. But anyway, that's a whole t another different story. So, the Lord Jesus Christ, he came at a perfect time when it was unified, the empire. That's when he came. Came down at a time when the empire was unified. Okay, but uh, let's, interestingly, just a side note, that was the same thing with uh, Genghis Khan. He unified a lot of the Asian countries together as a conqueror, and that's when Christianity was able to spread. But we'll come to that later on in the future, okay? All right. Uh, let's keep reading over here. He says over here, These are identified as the king of the south and the king of the north in view of their geographical relations to the land of Israel. See what God's looking at? The names he gives to them. The historical nations, why they're involved. He's only concentrating in Israel. 
So all these other nations, he sees them as uh, some, how it relates to Israel. That's how he views history. He doesn't view history like the Gentiles. The Gentiles, they view history in all their Gentile nations. God don't see it that way. That's why he comes up with different names, terms, and then the nations, how they move, their interactions. He's, all, he's judging all of history by the nation of Israel. He doesn't, he, he doesn't even give them the name over there. He just says, oh, I, all I see is Israel. And yeah, the two nation, the important nations that are involved is just one guy from the north and one guy at the south. And by the way, it's not just one king. As time passed by, there were multiple kings from the south and the north. The Lord don't care. <laughs> Lord honestly don't care, man. Well, it's, it's, it ain't, the, the name ain't right, you know. It should be Kumaru, not Darius. God don't care. See, God don't care what name he gives. That's the problem with historians. They all, and the theologians, they all pressure themselves and they're like saying, we got to find the right name over here. And John MacArthur was uh, breaking his tail so hard to do that, he says, Guburu seems less likely compared to Cyrus. So the same Darius is referring to Cyrus. But secular scholars debunk that and they say, this doesn't seem to make sense over here, you know, because it seems to point out two separate rulers when Daniel reigned. MacArthur, he tries to unify them. And then he comes up with a different biblical interpretation to try to justify the king's setup. No, you just have to look at a spiritual plane. Wow. He keeps trying to look at a Gentile historical plane. Wow. You got to look at it, God's spiritual historical point of view. And the focal point is Israel. All other nations and directions that's being around it, that's how he sees it. All right, now let's keep reading over here. Verse 6, In the end of ye years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that beget her, and he that strengthened her in these times. So this is a reference uh, to Bernice, who's the daughter of Ptolemy II, who is also known as Ptolemy Philadelphus. So he married Antiochus Theos, who was the third king of Syria that time. So his daughter married right over here, the Syrian king. To Bern Let's see, did I say uh, Bernice over here? Yeah, Bernice, did I say that? Okay. Now, let's keep reading. Many intrigues, including many assassinations and many battles, mark the ensuing histories. Now, if you look at verse 7, you'll notice that a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, come with an army, enter into the fortress of the king of the north, Syria, and shall deal against them and prevail. That's referring to the brother of Bernice, who is Ptolemy Energetus, the successor of Ptolemy Philadelphus, and he invaded and sacked Syria in revenge for the assassination of Bernice, actually. Wow. Now we look at verse uh, 10, but his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So, uh, his sons are referring to the sons of the Syrian king over here, including, wo including one who would soon become known as Antiochus the Great. So Antiochus the Great, king of Syria. He passed through Israel to get to Egypt. So that's why God sees the king of the south and north as important. Why? Because Israel is in between. And he says, oh yeah, some guy at the south and some guy at the north. <laughs> Within my homeland, yeah. Verse 11, the king of the south is mentioned again. And if you read verse 11, that's referring to Ptolemy Philopater gathering his own army and defeating the approaching Syrians. If you look at verse 15, it goes back to the king of the north. So it goes back to Antiochus the Great. He returns with a larger army and in order to reach Egypt, Egypt, he had to go through Israel, which was then under Egyptian control that time. If you look at verse 16, the glorious land over here would be referring to the nation of Israel, according to Dr. Morris. It was repeatedly overrun and devastated by the Egyptian and Syrian armies in their ongoing wars. 
Then if you look at verse 17, what happens is this battle that goes between Egypt and Syria, back and forth, back and forth, it gets tried to alliance itself again through a woman again, like what they did with Bernice. Verse 17, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of woman, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. Okay, what that means is this, is that you'll notice over here that there's a special title given to this woman. It's as if it's the daughter of woman. You'll notice that, right? Being a daughter of woman, but notice how, because being a special type of woman, he also wants her to be corrupted. So that kind of title would actually match with Cleopatra, actually. That's where she comes in. So Cleopatra is mentioned in your Bible over here. So how she relates to this um, conflict between Egypt and Syria was that it reads, Dr. Morris, the daughter of woman was the first Cleopatra, then a child and still under the care of her mother and a nurse. She was the daughter of Antiochus from Syria. And he espoused her to the young Ptolemy Epiphanes, son of the Egyptian king, Egypt. That's why she ended up in Egypt, Cleopatra. Let's keep reading over here. Uh, who had enlisted the Romans to help him in opposing Antiochus. When the wedding was eventually consummated, however, Cleopatra sided with her husband against her father. So see, he was hoping to use Cleopatra. Notice it says, uh, he shall give him the daughter of woman corrupting her. But what happens is, instead of herself being corrupted by her father's plans, she instead uh, joins her husband's side. Now let's look at verse 18. A prince rises up. This is Scipio Asiaticus, who's the leader of the Roman army in Asia Minor. Defeated the large naval forces brought against him by Antiochus. Antiochus was later slain in trying to raise the tribute laid on him by the Romans. So now Rome starts to come in. Where Greece had its division broken empire, Rome was coming in because it was coming like an iron. We see over here that at uh, following... Uh, verse 21 and onwards, this is where it's going to get interesting. So we're going to look at Larkin's point of view over here. All right, We're going to differ from Rockman's point of view over here. So remember in our Revelation studies, I gave you, uh, the, uh, I gave you a full perspective. That way you can make a more informed decision for the Revelation 7 churches on their dates. Right? You might recall that. So I'm going to do the same thing over here actually. Tonight, I'm not going to give you Rockman's perspective, but his perspective is way more interesting, and we'll cover that in our next discipleship class, okay? Verse 20, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. So whoever that person is, well, let's come to uh, Larkin's point of view. Morris agrees. He says in verse 21 and 20 the following. The vile person was Antiochus Epiphanes, the second son of Antiochus the Great. And he was indeed one of the most morally degraded of men. He usurped the Syrian throne from his brother's son by trickery. His brother, Seleucius Philopater, had been assassinated while trying to raise taxes to pay the tribute which the Romans had imposed on his father. So that's why verse 20 it was very quick. The man was destroyed, and then Antiochus Epiphanes quickly took over. Verse 21, uh, 29, excuse me. Antiochus Epiphanes carried out one successful invasion and plundering of Egypt at verse 25, and had also plundered Israel in the process. The second foray into Egypt, however, would be repelled by the Romans. Verse 31, the abomination that maketh desolate. In Larkin's point of view, he sees as Antiochus Epiphanes here, and Morris agrees, becomes a type of the final Antichrist. It is believed that Epiphanes, aided by traitorous Jews, sacrificed a sow on the altar and erected a statue of Zeus in the temple at Jerusalem. 
The motive behind this was his ambition to unify the great empire left him by his father, which extended all the way to India, which is why India had persia Greco influence. No surprise there. By compelling all the people to adopt the Greco-Roman system of culture and pantheistic religion. Now Roman was taking over Greco influence. Verse 32, we see that these blasphemous acts of Antiochus Epiphany stirred the who? The, the peop, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Here we cover, according to the Morse's and Larkin's point of view, the Maccabees. Here's where the Maccabees come in because they're tired of this Syrian king. So then they start out their wars. That's where the Maccabees come in. Morris says over here, led by an aged priest, Mattathias and his sons, especially Judas, a successful war of independence was waged against Antiochus. Ending in 165 BC, a date still commemorated annually in the Jewish feast of Hanukkah. These men became known as the Maccabees. You know what Maccabees means, which is very interesting? There was one kingdom that destroyed Grecian Empire. It was Rome. Why? Because they were an iron kingdom. Maccabees meant hammer. So like an iron hammer, so to speak. That's how they were able to break off the Grecian power. The uh, what we see over here now is that the remaining parts of Scripture, according to dispensationalist scholars, is that if you go from many days at verse 33, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil. Notice how long? Many days. So this is where uh, Israel is on that hiatus. So now they go through... What? Throughout the past 2,000 years of church history, they went through these kind of turmoils. Sword, flame, captivity, spoil. Many, many days. And then the Lord sees a fit where Larkin, according to Larkin and Morris, is at verses uh, 34, especially 36 and onward, that this is the time when the Antichrist jumps in. Ruckman, he goes much earlier. He believes the Antichrist, which uh, I use quite often, He'll argue that the Antichrist goes all the way back to verse 20. Uh, he'll go back to verse 21. Verse 21. I'll show you something interesting later on where the Bible talks about in Daniel chapter 11, Octavius who inherited from Julius Caesar, who inherited all of this. The Bible, Daniel 11 mentions it in Ruckman's point of view. We're going to see that one in our next discipleship video. And we're also going to cover uh, Cleopatra, Antony, the rivalry between Antony and Octavius. And then where they were the ones fighting in the stead of who? Julius Caesar that I mentioned so many times a long time ago. Now we'll finally hit these guys and make, make preparation and make way for the Messiah. Hey. We're also going to talk about the flaw with these Maccabees and what the devil tried to do to corrupt Israel. He tried to ruin their religious system through the Apocrypha, where Maccabees was mentioned, and he used the Dead Sea Scrolls to a cultic group known as the Essenes. All right, next discipleship. Get ready for more action.